Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to day one of theCUBE's live coverage of Falcon 2024 here in Las Vegas. I'm your host, Rebecca Knight, sitting alongside my co-host and co-analyst, co-founder of theCUBE, Dave Vellante. We have very exciting guest. We have George Kurtz. He is the founder and CEO of CrowdStrike. Thank you so much for coming back on the here. show. Good to see you, George. Yeah, good to see you. So this show is it's your biggest Falcon yet. Um, 6,000 attendees. I was talking to your press people saying, I think we're going to outgrow this space pretty soon. I want to put you in a reflective mood. You started this company 13 years ago. What makes this year's Falcon so, so special and what are you most excited about? Well, as you said, when you look at the size and the growth of this, it's actually become a destination conference above and beyond just CrowdStrike. We have almost 100 partners here. We've got 2,300 different organizations and as you said, over 6,000 people. I think it could be a show that continues to gain momentum and something that you know, goes beyond just CrowdStrike. Sure, it's our event, but customers want to talk to partners. They want to hear about how we and others are solving security problems. And I think it's a great forum for it. And you know, if we outgrow this, fantastic. We'll make room somewhere. But uh, at the end of the day, we want to deliver value to partners and customers and have a place where security people can collaborate. And George, I've personally given you very high marks. I think you've done a tremendous job of being transparent about the July 19th incident and communicating to the public. How is CrowdStrike uh, communicating to its employees, its partners, its customers? What's the message on how you're moving forward? Sure, well, July 19th obviously was a transformational event for us, right? It was an unfortunate event for customers and us alike and anyone affected by it. But I think the message has been clear from our customers, right? Which is they understand, they appreciate the transparency, and they want to move forward as well. And we talked about what happened, why it happened, why it won't happen again. And really what they want to do is get back to business. And I think what we heard consistently as we talked to hundreds and thousands of customers in a very short period of time is, we love your technology. It's the best in the marketplace. Keep doing what you're doing, right? Keep protecting us against the adversaries and keep innovating. And that is my message back. That was part of my message today. We're going to keep driving innovation back into our customer base. We're going to move forward, but we're going to be more resilient coming out of this and we're going to help our customers be more resilient. This concept of resilience as a foundational element for us and for our customers. The fact that we need to adapt and our customers need to adapt, right? And we need to understand and recognize that they're all in different businesses and industries and they have different requirements, right? To be secure and to be resilient and we need to continuously learn and create that feedback loop of doing the best that we can but also helping them continuously learn and adapt in their security. So it's, it's a part of who we are um, and it's a part of what we're doing going forward. But again, we're not straying from our knitting of focusing on customers and helping them stop breaches. Critical part of that message here is that business resilience and of course having Satya on stage. I've talked to dozens of customers here, 100%, uh, super excited about that and really appreciate um, that happening. Um, and you bringing Satya on, demonstrating uh, the, actually the collaboration between uh, companies that oftentimes have been competitors, so congratulations on that. Yeah. Well done. Thank you, and it was super gracious of him to come. We collaborated extensively from the initial phase of the incident through weeks after and even to the latest security summit they had. And we appreciate that. And I think when you look at this incident and when you look at security, not one company can solve everything in security. And I've always said security parallels the slope of the technology curve, right? So you need a lot of security players that are out there. Obviously we're one of the big ones we're helping to consolidate. But it's an ecosystem and we're partnering with Microsoft we're helping them, they're helping us, but ultimately both companies are helping joint customers and that's what's most important. I've done many shows at the Aria. My favorite moment of Falcon so far was walking into the hall and seeing, basically I call it the stack, all the layers. <laughs> you know? So yeah. I wonder if you could address that. Uh, you, you, you would call it the platform. Right. Um, and all the different pieces of it. You are a platform company. And I'd like to understand what makes CrowdStrike different when I started CrowdStrike, there really was no security platform company. And when I looked across the other industry, whether it was Workday, or ServiceNow, or Salesforce, when you thought about security, there, there was no platform company. 
It wasn't any of the legacy players that you knew about. So for me, it was really to help transform security and bring it into that cloud era. Now, it may seem commonplace today, but it was revolutionary back then. And yeah, a lot of people go, well, wait a minute, you can do all this from the cloud and the cloud is scary and, and those sort of things. But what we did differently and what we still do today differently is we collect data once and reuse it many times. So we've really figured out that the architecture we built is best in class in the industry, allows us to very efficiently collect this security telemetry data, IT data, and then we create use cases on top of it that allow workflows to, to be created to solve security problems. Then when you add the AI layer on top of it, and we were doing AI before it was fashionable, that was machine learning back then, now we call it Gen AI, it's two different types. But that has really transformed security in terms of detection and prevention, and now this generative workflow that allows us to take eight hours of work and compress it into 10 minutes. So that's the power of the platform, and that's the power of helping customers consolidate these disparate technologies to solve real security problems. Reminds me of the worm drive. Write once, read many. There you nice go, exactly that. right. You're too young to remember that. <laughs> I, I am too young for that. But, but going back to what you were talking about with the collaboration, and, and obviously the, the big example was with Satya Nadella, yeah. but you're, you're not just collaborating with major players like, like Microsoft, there's also a bunch of smaller vendors. So talk a little bit about the collaboration that's taking place here at Falcon with cybersecurity and IT professionals from many of the world's top companies as, as well as small up and comers, as well as the collaboration and an innovation that takes place all the time within the CrowdStrike ecosystem. Absolutely. Well, one of the big ones, and I'll talk about some of the others, we announced on Monday was NVIDIA, or an AWS, and the continued collaboration there, which we all know Gen AI is driving tremendous change in our industry, and it's also generating tremendous opportunities for the adversaries, right? So we need to be one step ahead of them uh, from uh, being able to protect these AI workloads, which we're seeing massive proliferation. When you think about all the partners here, uh, amazing partner ecosystem. I, again, when I started the company with 25 slides, it, I, I wouldn't have thought of all these partners that are here, it's incredible. Awesome. But again, it's, you have to reflect on the fact that not one company can solve it, right? And we had a great announcement with Zscaler. You know, we're, we're more agent and, and cloud-based and, and you know, they take care of many things on the network, delivered from the cloud. But you need that level of collaboration. But customers ultimately want to take the best of platform. It used to be best of breed, then it was best of suite, now it's really best of platform, and they want to assemble these together. They don't want to be engineers. They don't want to be integrators. A customer shouldn't be a system integrator. They should be able to take the best of platform, put them together, and that's really what we're helping to drive here. I want to ask you about next-gen SIM. It sounds like a marketing term, but last year you announced Raptor, you took log scale, you embedded it in. What's next? Gen SIM, how is it different than old gen SIM? That's a good question, and it's something, I mean, for many years we got customers basically telling us what they wanted. They didn't call it next gen SIM. They said, look, you've got a foundational platform. We use it for pretty much everything in our environment, but we still have to take your data and put it somewhere else because there's other areas they don't cover, like network as a good example. So we're taking 80% of what goes into our SIM and we're taking it and putting it you know, we're taking it out of your platform and putting it into a SIM. And they said, why don't you just open your platform up? Why don't we go the other way? Why don't we take the 20% and put it back into your platform? And we already have these workflows, we're used to it, we can already hunt on it, you guys have an AI layer on top of it, you've got all this rich data. So, I don't know, probably four or five years ago, we acquired a company called Humio, which was renamed to Logscale. We integrated that, and that was part of our Raptor release, and now, you know, 30,000 plus customers have access to our next gen SIM. So really what we have the ability to do is take the other 20%, ingest that in, now even using AI parser so that even if we've never seen the data before, we can figure it out and ingest it, and then create a unified workflow to be able to hunt and detect novel and new threats and solve real security use cases. It's been very well received. And the data model is critical here. So you, you, you talked about this, you got the data, you're feeding you know, dashboards and visualizations. Of course you have a knowledge graph that you guys created years ago. Uh, you're driving automations with that data. Now you, you, not now, you've always had, you've had a long roadmap of machine learning, like you said you used to call it that, but you're injecting intelligence to the system. That comprises the platform 
And that is really your, your flywheel, is yes. it not? That's right. Uh, the more of this security telemetry we collect, the more relevant um, IT information, the smarter the platform gets. A, a customer is able to solve use cases beyond security, like what assets do we have? What state are they in? What's the hygiene? Are they running out of memory? Are they running out of disk space? Uh, are there exposures? Are there things that need to be patched? And one of the most critical things in any organization is just understanding what assets you have and what state they're in. So we spend a lot of time and effort in our exposure management area. Whether it's vulnerability management, risk, whether it's um, you know, cloud exposure, we have all of that rich information. So once you have that, and that's what we found as we built this technology, we, it's, it's one of these things like an epiphany. We didn't really understand how scalable our technology was in the architecture we built. And customers said, well why don't you solve all these different use cases, you already have this, this data. They were solving it before we were, and then we just created the use cases and modules around it. We, we just had Dscaler and CrowdStrike on talking about how customers were giving them the idea of, of partnering together. So I mean, that's, that's what's so exciting about the kind of feedback that you're getting. Um, now, consolidation is an enduring theme here. Can you talk a little bit about CrowdStrike's approach and how it removes complexity from security operations and stops breaches? Sure. Most customers, just, it's human nature. What do they want? They want things to be simple, they want things to work, and they want really good value or total cost. Customers are humans. Customers so are sense. humans, right? <laughs> you do that in your daily life, right? So what we're able to do with our platform is really take that and 10 exit. We've already have this very rich data set. So once we collect the data, it's already collected. So then we can expose that data and create these modular workflows. Or a customer can create their own workflow with something like Foundry. And good things happen when you listen to customers. It's not, you know, I always say, it's not complex, it's just hard, right? You just need to listen to the customer, they'll tell you what you want, you get together with a, a good partner, a great partner like Zscaler, and you solve problems. And that's really what we've done. We just listen to folks and we said, we've got this data, how do we make your life easier? How do we drive down the cost? And how do we help you consolidate? And it really ties into things like Falcon Flex, I'm sure we'll talk about, but customers want it to be easy and they want it to just work, and I think that's a hallmark of what we've been able to do. That's where I wanted to go. I wanted to talk about CrowdStrike Financial Services, which is a yep. great business, uh, makes it, again, easier for customers and Falcon Flex, which I think plays into your resilience story, because if I can flexibly not have to go to procurement every time and I can get a new module that I need virtually instantly, uh, make it facile, that brings business resilience. So I wonder if you could sort of uh, share with the audience what, what you've done with uh, financial services and how Falcon Flex fits in. Yeah, so let's maybe start with Flex and then we'll, we'll get to financial services. So Flex is something we announced late last year. We really got it going in the beginning yep. of this year. And we've driven a tremendous amount of um, annual recurring revenue associated with it. That's one. Well, why is that? Well, how did we get the idea? We sat down with customers again and listened. And we actually had some of our biggest customers help us design the program. They came to us and said, hey, we want to do more with CrowdStrike. We want to buy more, we want to consolidate, we want more modules. But we can't keep going back through procurement. Like, it just takes too long and it's a hassle. And you saw maybe the, the keynote this morning where I said, you know, uh, everyone loves procurement, said no one. <laughs> Unless you're in procurement, maybe you do. But it's, um, and, and, and you have to go through the process, but how do you make it easier? And, and really the heart of your question is, how do you make these modules available to customers when they need them and how they need them and where they want to use them so that you don't create these gaps or seams in their environment. So as an example, uh, you have a customer may start with a, with a bill of material, and then as their needs change, or as they have additional potential exposures, they can easily pull down that module and deploy it without going through procurement. Maybe they're going big in cloud. Well, they have to protect cloud, so they'll be able to deploy our Falcon Cloud security very easily without going through that whole process. So it makes their life easier, provides better security, removes the friction in the, uh, in the procurement phase, and helps the partner. Now the partner is working on a demand plan rather than let's go through another procurement cycle, and they're working with the customer to actually deploy more modules and leverage that, that burn down that we've actually created. So you start with a commitment, the more you commit, the bigger the discount, you burn it down, you can recommit and go from there. I want to ask you about the AI wave. Um, there's still a few skeptics out there 
you've been around, you've seen waves before. What, what's the probability that this is, um, this is a dud? Um, what's your confidence that this wave, like many of us, think that it's you know, bigger than anything we've ever seen? What, what's your take? I, I'm 100% confident it's not a dud. <laughs> it's just revolutionary, and I'm sure many folks have played in their own world with a chat GPT or a Claude or what have you, and you realize what you can actually do, not just in security, but across your life. So we're really in the early innings. I always say we're just getting out of the dugout, taking off the batting weight, getting ready to step up to the plate. That's where we are today. A lot of the Gen AI products focus on chatbots. Let's take the collective knowledge of something and make it available to our customers. We certainly have done that with uh, Charlotte AI of the 10 years of doing this. We've got, as you might imagine, a tremendous amount of security intelligence and threat information. But the big piece of Gen AI, the next wave of it, is really this, these AI agents. And if you look at Charlotte, Charlotte not only can answer a question with the collective knowledge of everything CrowdStrike knows, but also can take action and generate workflows, and that's doing work on behalf of the customer. And that's the power of an AI agent. They're doing work on your behalf. And we spend a lot of time building Charlotte as a foundational element to our Falcon platform, and the ability to tie into all the workflows that we have. And you move from point and click workflows to generative workflows. And I think that, that's why this is not a fad. I'm with you. I mean, we're only, we're not even two years in to the shot with the GPT heard around the world. And we're already at LLM 2.0, which is what you just described. Yeah. And 3.0 is going to really blow us away. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> so, during the many conversations that we're having here on theCUBE and the conversations that are taking place in the hub and, and elsewhere, we are, it's enough to give us a heart attack about just how dangerous it is out there. Our adversaries, the bad guys, are only getting smarter. The tools at their disposal are only becoming uh, more evident and, and cheaper for them, right. too, to utilize. What do you see as the, the key trends that are shaping your industry going forward? I think there's two, two big themes. One is, uh, is Gen AI, and then the second one is the time window has just been compressed dramatically <clears throat> on how these adversaries work and how, how fast they can execute their, their plans. It used to be hours, now it's minutes. And, well, why is that? Well, when you look at the democratization of Gen AI, you can take a handful of collectively around the world, collective handful uh, of people. And I mean that, you know, not five, but lots of people, but in the grand scheme of eight billion people in the world, it's collectively small. You can take their knowledge, and that's the tip of the pyramid. So you can take that, put it into a generative AI model, and then you can actually flow that collective knowledge down to the masses. So think of pyramid, smart at the top, pretty smart in the middle, and then you got the masses at the bottom. And the masses at the bottom can execute something with amazing precision, amazing accuracy, with a skill level that would be un unheard of just four years ago. And they can do that in a compressed time window of minutes. So it's the democratization of these very esoteric techniques and making it available to the masses, which has really helped compress that time window. So, little story. Long time ago, back when Japan, you might remember when Japan was in its ascendancy and they were going to wipe out all the US companies, I was sitting in Japan with a very senior level person at a well-known company, it was actually um, in the book Chip War, but anyway, and he looked at me very deeply and said, how is it that American companies are able to innovate? Because you know, generally, at the time, the Japanese companies, and even still today, you start to see this in China, they'll sort of copy and make a better product. And so, my question to you is, how is it that you won't stop innovating? What is, what is it about the culture, the DNA, that enables you specifically, but you know, American exceptionalism generally to keep innovating? I think you, you covered a few of them, which would be the culture, and just the drive to come out with the latest and the best technology to solve a real problem. When I started this company, I, I saw the industry was just stale. And I talked to a few folks about my idea and they're like, that's crazy, that's never going to work, right? And we had a lot of the legacy players that would poke fun at us, right? Hey, that's never going to work. And slowly but surely, 
you know, many of those players have fallen by the wayside. So I think it has to start with your DNA and your culture to never be satisfied and to realize that this isn't just solving a problem today. This isn't like you built something and it's good for 20 years, right? You have to continue to innovate in security because there's someone on the other side trying to out-innovate you. And that's the fascinating part about security. It's the fun part is that it's not just one problem that you're solving, right? It's not a physics problem, it's a human problem because you have an adversary, an opponent on the other side that's always trying to outdo you. And that's why the pace of innovation is so great in security. And that's why we have so many people at CrowdStrike that are dedicated to the mission of stopping breaches and driving innovation to help customers. A lot of CEOs from successful companies will tell you, just like you said, that first they dismiss you, and then they try to deposition you, right. and then they copy you. Exactly, <laughs> that's exactly that's right. That's when you know you're onto something good. Exactly right. Well, George Kurtz, always a pleasure having you on theCUBE. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you so much, and look Great forward to seeing you see next year at an even bigger Falcon. Indeed, to that. indeed. I'm Rebecca Knight for Dave Vellante. Come back tomorrow for more of theCUBE's live coverage of Falcon 2024. You're watching theCUBE, the leader in enterprise tech news and analysis.